Welcome back for this week's technical. Those of you who've been following me for some time know that I intersperse these with my vlogs. If you guys like any of these videos and you're new to the channel, don't be afraid to click subscribe. In this technical, I'm covering some of the genes that affect sheep fertility and specifically fecundity, and that's the number of lambs a ewe will have in a given year. Now, bear in mind, I'm stepping slightly outside my comfort zone as a jobbing vet, but this is something relevant to most commercial farmers. I think genomics will play a bigger role in years to come if I misphrase some of the finer detail. Go easy on me, but let me know. Fertility in an individual animal is affected by lots and lots of different factors. So genetics, infectious disease, nutrition, all of these things play a big role. And even when we drill down into genetics, most traits are affected by a swathe of different genes. There's no one gene for growth, there's no one gene for temperament, and there's no one gene for fertility. Instead, there are many different genes feeding in to the overall picture. That being said, not all genes are created equal. Some have disproportionate effects on the given trait. So getting away from fertility for a second, if we think about muscularity, conformation, carving ease, myostatin would be one gene which has a disproportionate effect on all of these things, but at the same time, it doesn't have a monopoly. There are also plenty of other genes feeding into these traits. So back to sheep fecundity, who are the genetic big hitters? A quick reminder, with nearly all genes, we inherit two copies, one from our dam and one from our sire. How exactly these two genes work together or against each other depends on the gene in question, but the fundamental is the same. We get one copy from dad, one copy from mum. When the copies of genes inherited from each parent are different, we call that animal a heterozygote because hetero means different or opposite. In contrast, when the copies we inherit are the same, we call that animal a homozygote. Of course, homo means the same. Let's start with the Inverdale gene. This is actually a mutation of the BMP15 gene, also called FECX, originally found in Romneys. If a ewe is carrying one copy, that increases her ovulation rate by about one, which ends up leading to an increased litter size of about 0.6 ewes per lamb. So, say we had an imaginary flock in which no ewe was carrying any Inverdale gene. That flock, one year, might scan at 150%. If everything else stayed the same, but we waved our magic wand and gave all of those ewes one copy, as in they were heterozygotes for the Inverdale gene, the ewes reared per lamb would jump by 0.6 or 60% when we were expressing it as a scanning percentage, jumping from 150% to about 210%. There are other mutations in this gene you can also find in Romneys, as well as Cambridges and Belle Clares. However, the Inverdale gene has a sting in its tail. It's carried on the female sex chromosome, that's called the X chromosome. If a ewe lamb inherits two copies of that Inverdale gene, she's rendered sterile. So, although the heterozygotes get a big lift in fertility, the homozygotes essentially are wiped out. Because rams, being males, are XY, they only have one copy of this gene and they will always pass it on to their daughters. But because their sons only inherit the Y chromosome, it is never passed on to their sons. What does this mean in practice? It means this gene in particular has to be very carefully manipulated in a commercial setting to avoid generating lots of these double Inverdale sterile females. Ideally, we generate females with one copy that are then very fecund. They could then be bred to a terminal sire with none of those resulting females being kept for breeding to avoid doubling up of that mutation. Perhaps we do this by using an Inverdale carrying ram over some hill ewes, which is exactly what Innovis and HGC did back in 2005 and 6. HCC and Innovis ran an experiment crossing either traditional crossing sires like a blue face Leicester versus an Inverdale carrying Texel over hill ewes. They then followed those progeny and grand progeny on to see how they performed. As you might expect, the Inverdale cross ewe lambs were much more prolific. Here are some of those results. For the full report, I put a link in the video description. Next up is the Barula gene. I hope I'm saying that right. Also known as FEC B. This isn't inherited on a sex chromosome. Instead, this is one of the regular chromosomes we call an autosome. Specifically, it is a mutation of the BMP. 
MPR1B gene found on chromosome 6. Unlike Inverdale, an animal with two copies has an additive effect, as in the effect adds together. So heterozygotes for the Barula gene, as in they carry one copy, their ovulation rate is increased by about 1.5. That increases litter size by about one lamb per U. But if they carry two copies, that increases the ovulation rate by three, resulting in an increased litter size of about 1.5 lambs per U. That is an extra 150% added to the scanning percentage. So even more extreme than the Inverdale gene. This gene was first identified in Merinos and actually geneticists were able to trace it back to the Garol or Bengal sheep from India. These were introduced to Australia in the late 18th century. Tests on those sheep in India found them to be entirely homozygous for this Barula mutation. The third and final gene we best understand is GDF9, which actually has a number of different mutations that feed into fecundity. Like the Barula gene, it's found on an autosome, not a sex chromosome. Things get a bit more complicated with GDF9 because there are actually several different mutations that act slightly differently. With one of them, like the Inverdel gene, if an animal is homozygous, has two copies, then the animal is rendered sterile. But with others, it is additive. So Lincoln University in New Zealand offers a test for this variant called C1111G to A. Very catchy. If you want more information from them on that mutation, I've put a link to their guide in the video description as well. Lincoln reckon that with one copy of this gene, ewes will have an extra 0.2 of a lamb, whereas with two copies, they'll have an extra 0.46 of a lamb. There are other mutations that are related to fecundity. There's the Woodlands gene, or FECX2, found in Coopworth flocks. It's also found on the X chromosome, but unlike the Inverdale, double carriers are not sterile. It's a strange mode of inheritance where it can only be inherited from the sire and not from the dam. Then there's the Thoker gene, found in Icelandic sheep. For those of you following Kami at the sheep game, you'll have seen them recently. It's named after a ewe called Thoker, from which all multiple birth Icelandic sheep are thought to descend. Crossing Thoker sheep with Chibius appears to lift the lambs per ewe by 0.7, although there does seem to be some infertility linked to this gene, possibly due to double carriers. And then there are other breeds with suspected fecundity genes because they're so prolific. So there's Lacaunae, apologies if that's wrong, the Bel Il from France, the Old Kuska from Poland, and some of the New Zealand long wool breeds. Much less work has been done on these populations, but we suspect from their prolificacy that they harbor some sort of fecundity gene. As for how these genes interact with each other, that's really dependent on each specific combination. So some combinations multiply, some combinations add up, and some combinations result in sterility, much like the double Inverdales. How might this information actually be used by a sheep farmer today? Going back to that HCC Innovis project, I think there probably is some scope for using an Inverdale carrying ram over some low fecundity hardy hill you to produce a cross you which has a particularly exceptional fertility really it would just be a modification of the traditional stratified system with those ewes hopefully just going on to produce fat lambs with none of those resulting grand progeny being kept for breeding and also i suppose a word of caution we've also got to consider that while massive scanning percentages always sound great in the pub in january come lambing time they can actually cause a lot of headaches I've noticed a lot of farmers moving away from that more is better to looking for an optimum scanning percentage for their system. Now for some systems, more might be better, but that's certainly not the case for all farms. In my experience, unlike with cattle, fertility in sheep isn't normally a limiting factor for the number of lambs sold per ewe, a more commercially pertinent figure than scanning percentage. More lambs scanned will probably mean more work and not necessarily a correspondingly high number of lambs sold. You'll need the inputs, whether that's fertilizer, labor, or feed to match to those lambs. That's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, don't be afraid to click subscribe, ring the little bell, give the video a thumbs up, and leave me a comment. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed doing the homework for it. Otherwise, I will see you later this week for the vlog. Over and out.